So, um, one of the key roles going forward that's been identified is the role of the dentist, the general dentist, the hygienist, whoever, in increasing diagnosis of von, of von Willebrand's disorder. Why is it such an underdiagnosed condition? Well, I think it's the attitudes of society, the stigma about talking about heavy periods, the stigma about external bleeding, the stigma in some um, societies about disclosing a bleeding disorder that may hinder your marriage partnership choices. Uh, lots of things because of people's attitudes to people with bleeding disorders. I think why it's undiagnosed is because the medical profession have often trivialized symptoms. So somebody will talk about the bleeding that they had after dental extraction or the bleeding that they had after childbirth and it's kind of trivialized. And the attitudes of family, and this is really, really, really important, is that because, as Kate explained, the way that this condition is passed through generations of families is that everybody has the same bleeding. So somebody's heavy periods may not be considered heavy because everybody in the family has always been like that. So they don't know it's different. Why is it underdiagnosed? It's underdiagnosed because it's difficult to diagnose. If somebody's diagnosed with haemophilia and their APTT is raised or whatever, it's a fairly straightforward test to test levels of factor eight or factor nine. But as you saw from Kate, actually diagnosing von Willebrand's takes specialist laboratory staff, very, and, and especially the more rare types who have to do a lot of platelet function studies and various stuff, means that you need a good level of hematologist lab support. So people will say there's no bleeding disorder because they're not using the test that you need to diagnose it. And the other thing is, it takes a long time to diagnose. So going through the full cycle takes six to 12 months. So somebody gets lost, they get kind of fed up, they lose interest and they, they kind of you know, have to go to several appointments and think, oh, I can't be dealing with this. And I think that when people are diagnosed, it's a way sometimes when they can make sense of the past, that they've always had this condition. And once they've got their diagnosis, which may be after surgery, it may be after another family member was diagnosed, it makes sense, ah oh, yes, I bled when I had my teeth out or I bled when I had my teeth cleaned really badly. The problem was that was often either ignored or it was kind of trivialized or thought it was a one-off thing or your family says, oh, you always bleed for three days after a dental extraction because that's normal in the family. But more than that, it's often associated with us having done something wrong. I went to that dentist, that butcher of a dentist, and I bled for a week afterwards. So what that means is the patient has blames, blames the dentist. They don't know they've got a diagnosis. And the dentist is kind of thinking, what have I done? Or, oh my goodness, I can't let anyone know in my practice about this because my patients will be scared. So I think we hide instead of using that information to really change um, somebody's life by getting a much earlier diagnosis. So I think that we can help with an attitude change, but also with tweaks to how we take our histories and what we do following a bleed with our patients. Because we read in the literature, it's not uncommon for about 10% of uh, dental extractions to bleed. Actually, probably most of those are undiagnosed bleeding disorders. Because actually, unless something's got lots of inflammation, it shouldn't bleed um, in a, dent a dental extraction, however much you ham it up. It should actually, it's usually that there's probably something going on in a bleeding history. So,
The first thing that we should do when we take on any new patient, whether they've got a disability, whether you're seeing them for orthodontics, whatever your role, we need to take a bleeding history. Just like we take a cardiac history, just like we take everything else, our drug history, we should take a basic bleeding history. Not necessarily because we're going to do something that makes people bleed, but we're a healthcare provider and we have something in our culture um, where I was trained that says make every medical appointment count. That means doctors have to nudge our patients to look after their mouths. We, have to, we can provide a screening service for people at risk of diabetes if we see un, you know, uncontrolled periodontal disease. We can actually start somebody on a question about their bleeding history or their bleeding diagnosis just by taking a bleeding history as part of our medical diagnosis, um, a medical history. The next thing it is, is if we notice that after we've done a routine cleaning or a dental extraction and we see extended bleeding, somebody comes back with a bleed, to take a more in-depth bleeding history. Yes, we'll manage the bleed, and yes, we'll repack, and we'll suture, and we'll do all the stuff that we do, but just delve a bit more into the bleeding history, and I'll tell you how to do that in an effective way, because communication is really important here because of the way people normalize bleeding. And then if we find within that questioning that somebody has something in their medical bleeding history that rings alarm bells, we signpost that person not to a general practitioner, their general dent doctor. We signpost them to hematology. Because where we find that people seeking a diagnosis get stalled is in their doctor who says, ah, sure, you'll be fine. Ah, sure, your periods will be fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, oh, nosebleeds are fine. So we must make sure that we signpost people to a haematologist. And we need to help them via a detailed, supportive referral letter because they take notice of dental bleeds. It's part of the diagnostic criterion, what's called the BAT score, to actually, which is how haematologists decide whether someone's got a bleeding disorder. Dental bleeding is one of the diagnostic criteria. So whereas we might send that to, a gen, to an ordinary doctor, they'll say, ah, oh, sure, okay, bit of dental bleeding. If it goes to a haematologist with a referral letter that says it bled for 16 hours when I would expect bleeding to have stopped after 20 minutes, they'll take notice. If you say to them, I did a routine cleaning which should not have caused any bleeding and my patient was still bleeding 24 hours later, they'll take notice, but they need detail. So it's this communication, okay? So what's the motivation for us? Because it takes time to write that letter. It takes time to do it. But I think for me, it's the fact that reading the Cinderella study, reading all of the stuff that we hear from women, we know that if they're underdiagnosed, if they're not diagnosed, their anemia alone can cause them to be so fatigued, they give up their jobs, they don't take jobs that are very, um, that are what they should be, they miss time from school because they can't get up in the morning because they're so tired. We know they have reduced participation in sport because of the bleeding. We know that they probably are having to deal with periods that are lasting more than a week. We know that they have difficulty conceiving children if they haven't got a diagnosis. They just don't know why they can't you know, get pregnant. Um, so we can prevent the fact that the first time they realize they've got a really big blingless history is when they have to have a big operation and they're hemorrhaging. So I think as a service, whatever the background, our job in being able to find one of those di diagnostic criteria is really key. We in our dental profession are always moaning, well I am, about how I want medical teams 
to talk about oral health. As Dr. Kumar said, putting the mouth into the body. But then we have to pay our part too, because we can't ask people to do things that we wouldn't do. So this is our payback. This is our holistic care. And this also is our way to remind people that we're that team. Does that make sense? So my baseline bleeding history for a patient who I've never seen before would be these six questions and they'd be on my medical history. Have you or has anyone in your family been diagnosed with a bleeding condition? So anyone in your family? But I also use the word bleeder. In my language, a bleeder is what you call somebody who kind of bleeds a lot. But they haven't got a diagnosis, but they'd call themselves, oh, I'm a bleeder. Now, your culture will have a similar word. But I wrote a paper once that said, that was called the transition from bleeder to bleeding condition. So I say that. It's, uh, are you a bleeder? Do you cut, if you cut yourself, how long does it stop, you know, does it stop bleeding? So use layman's terms for something that means I bleed. Do you bruise easily or suffer from nosebleeds? Do you have heavy periods? Have you ever bled for a long time after a dental extraction or a deep dental cleaning? Have you ever bled for a long time after any type of surgery? Those are my screening questions for all of those patients. And if they say yes to any of those, I, to yes to any of those questions, I think a little bit deeper. Because A, it means I'm not going to get myself into trouble when I'm doing an extraction. I can actually be prepared for the fact that somebody might bleed. But B, I can help point them to diagnosis. Now, normal. Why I put caution here is because you may get no's to these questions. And why are you going to get no's? And that's because of the normalization of bleeding. So what's normal for you or I, not going to be normal for somebody who's had a bleeding condition ever since they were born. So when you ask somebody, do their gums bleed after brushing, you might expect that's gum bleeding. You might think that was gum bleeding. In fact, when I showed these three pictures to people with bleeding disorders, they didn't consider bleeding from the mouth at all until I showed them this picture. This was not bleeding. This was not bleeding. Excuse me. Where's my pictures? I'm losing the dramatic quality here. This is what they consider bleeding. So you can say, do you bleed from the mouth? No. But of course, you're not getting a proper no. So I think when we're taking our extended bleeding history, what my medical colleagues in the field say, we have to be specific. So if we have a patient and they bleed on us. We need to be specific when we're asking them questions or if they answer yes to any of our screening questions, be specific. So if I'm asking them, do they bruise easily? And they, you know, I'm saying larger than a two euro coin with little or no injury because, you know, they're not going to talk about bruising. Um, they might say no but I quantify it. Do you have a family member with a bleeding tendency? Do you have heavy periods? Now, the diagnosis from, um, from all of the patient organizations is do you have clots that are bigger than a euro coin? Whatever your, you use. I'm not in the UK, so I use the euro. Do you have to, so if you have heavy periods, that means changing your pads every two hours, lasting a week or more. That's what because people think that's normal, yeah? Do you have no nosebleeds more than once a week? Bleeding after surgery, cuts that don't stop bleeding after five minutes. Do you suffer or has anybody told you you've got low iron? If anybody um, says yes to two of those questions or more, they most definitely need a referral to a hematologist. And then the hematologist will do the BAT score or if they're answering yes to two of those questions, we don't go ahead with surgery without thinking we're going to need some decent local measures in there. Probably suturing and packing will be more than enough if somebody's, but 
we've got to realise that when we're taking a bleeding history, let's take it properly. Let's take it, let's remember that people think their bleeding is normal when it's not. So they're the haematologist. So finally, before I hand over to Lochina, what do we do if we've got a patient on our hands with bleeding? So unexpectedly, what we're going to see in von Willebrand's is different from what we see in haemophilia. Haemophilia is about the, the second part of the pathway. So we get good hemostasis at the time because the platelets work great. So you get your platelet plug, it's all going lovely, your suture, it's looking fine, you're thinking it's great, but the bleeding is later because that clot never organizes. The fibrin strands don't come across and knit it all together. So you get what is shown here at the bottom, which is that jelly clot. It sort of gets bigger and bigger, looks a bit like a raspberry or you know, a piece of liver, it gets big. And then because it swells, the patient's biting on it, it's traumatizing. That is a classic sign of a bleeding disorder. If you get that kind of clot, it rarely happens. Somebody's either got severe liver disease or they've got an underlying bleeding disorder. And that's the pattern at the bottom. So you're either going to see after, ble after cleaning, bleeding that's still happening, prolonged. We'd expect that to stop after five minutes. We'd expect it to stop after half an hour. If it's still bleeding around the gingival margins 24 hours later, um, that is not normal. Whatever the patient thinks, it needs an investigation. If we see that liver clot at the bottom, what do we do? Well, the current evidence is showing that in the past we would have said remove the jelly clot. So if we're stuck with this in practice. What we should be doing when we see that straight away is applying local anesthetic with adrenaline. So we get some local vasoconstriction. Then we remove the part of the clot just down to gum level. You don't remove it all the way from inside the wound, just so that it's level with the top of the gum. And then apply pressure with damp gauze. If you've got it, you should use antifibrolytic cyclocaparin. Dip your gauze into that and get the patient to bite onto it for at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Okay, that's going to get some antifibrolytics into that clot and stop the saliva from, um, from dissolving it. And ask the bleeding screening questions. Because, you know, while that patient is, well, you're, uh, you need to decide, is this something that I need to take action with? Is this something that I can apply pressure to, check my local measures and send the patient home. If that patient says yes to any of those in-depth screening questions, probably you're going to be needing to get that person to have some intravenous psychocaparin or to have some medical intervention. Or so, so not everybody, but if somebody is showing you have, you've missed a bleeding history, it's not anything to be scared of that you missed it. It's not usual to take an in-depth history. But that jelly clot is absolutely diagnostic, okay? So um, when you refer to a colleague or Max Fax or something like that, they will do two things. They will take a load of blood tests, but remember the von Willebrand is probably not gonna turn up. So they could well say, there's nothing, it's fine. The platelet levels are fine because von Willebrand doesn't reduce the number of platelets, it just reduces how they work. So they'll do their platelet tests, their platelet numbers, it'll be perfect. They'll do their haemophilia screening, their clotting screen, it'll be fine. But actually, um, so what I um, they would normally do iron levels too, because one of the big things that happens with people who've been bleeding for a long time is their iron level drops. So they'll do their iron levels too. But I think that the work that, but generally patients will be treated with cyclocaparin, it's an antifibrinolytic and it works at the tertiary side of hemostasis. It actually, um, it inhibits the dissolution of the clot, so it stabilizes the clot. It inhibits the clot being broken down. So it can be given 
to any patient. It can be given to patients even with those that are taking, uh, that are, they're at risk of stroke. All of the literature used to say you can't give cyclocaparin if somebody's got a stroke risk. You can't give cyclocaparin if somebody has got a um, plate, uh, has got, um, who's on an anticoagulant or whatever. All of the hematology guidelines now tell us unless someone's had a very, very recent thrombus or a, some recent stroke, they are fine to take cyclocaparin. You can give it topically. You can crush tablets up. You can bite, you can pot. You, we'll talk about local measures afterwards. Um, but I think that the, the thing that's really, really interesting about what happens when somebody bleeds is the follow-up that we do. Because the patient will be traumatized. They'll have had a bleed, and we know from the literature that most patients then never go back till three or four or five years, if ever, afterwards. So I think the follow-up that we they do that we do with them, did you go to the hematologist? Did you get your diagnosis? And most important, reassurance. That doesn't mean you can't ever go to a dentist again. Now that we know that you've got a, dent a, a diagnosis, or we don't, or we know you're a bleeder, we know what to do. So you must make sure that we reassure them, because at diagnosis is where most people stop going to the dentist. So I think that that little finishing off of the episode of somebody who's had a bleed, and this is the bit that we as dentists don't do because we're ashamed. We think, what did we do? I want to cover it up. I don't want to. But the, do the doctors are pleased when we find bleeders. I have one of the things that freaks the junior staff that come and work with me at the Haemophilia Center is that we have this group of patients called possible bleeding disorder. Possible. And we... Um, that means that they've done the, all the scoring. They don't really show any think, concrete on the bleeding tests, but they've got a bleeding history. It's kind of here or there. And then they need their wisdom teeth out, or they need a tooth out, and the doctors say, great, we'll find out once and for all. And they tell me that I have to take that tooth out with no special measures, because they want to know. So I have a procedure where they come in, I do everything as normal, no psychocaparin, no nothing, no... I would use suture and pack if I was doing a surgical wisdom tooth, but if I was doing an ordinary extraction, I'd do what I normally did. And then I'll keep the patient in the place for two, three hours afterwards, and sometimes they bleed. And I then have to... We have to sort out cyclocaparin, we suture them, we pack them, and the doctors say, great, they have a bleeding disorder of unknown etiology. That means they get their diagnosis. It's a diagnosis. It means we've got a bleeding disorder. It's, it's there. We don't know what's causing it, but we acknowledge that we need to give support if this person needs to give birth, an operation. Or if I do my extraction, and it doesn't bleed because dental is really diagnostic. And it doesn't bleed. The doctors say, great, doesn't have a bleeding disorder, goodbye, don't need to see you again. So I think this is really, really important, again, for our role in diagnosis. We have to be brave as well when we're working, but that's working with a team. Does that make sense? So if I find a patient that's bleeding, I'll pack, I'll suture, I'll put pressure on, use cyclocaparin if, I think, get, stop the bleeding, not an issue. So I think losing the fear of the bleeding is good. But what I'm saying is the hematologist will thank us for finding a bleeder uh, and turning a bleeder into someone with a diagnosis. And I think it's life-changing for women especially. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lochina. Thank you. Um, I have to go and um, do a couple of other talks that I'm doing. I'm having to do a lot of speeches and stuff at the moment in French this morning, nearly killed me. Um, but I won't be here for questions at the end of the session. Lochina will be able to answer all your questions. But if you've got any specific questions, please don't. I'm a bit of a geek on this bleeding disorders. It's, it's the focus of where I've done all my work. So if you've got any questions, 
um, that you want to ask me personally, please do stop me at a coffee break. I'll be very happy to answer those questions. But if I get overexcited talking about bleeding disorders, just shut me up and say, that's enough, Alison, now. OK, on you go. So OK, very nice to see you. And enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you.